Vulcan was one of the twenty Primarchs created by the Emperor of Mankind to lead his great crusade and reunite the scattered peoples of humanity. His Space Marine Legion was renamed the Salamanders in his honor. As with all the Primarchs, Vulcan inherited an aspect of his father. However for him this was the unique ability of being a perpetual, making him essentially immortal. Vulcan was able to regenerate fully from any injury, including a death that would vaporize him completely. This ability was unknown to him until the Horus Heresy. And during the Great Crusade he gained a reputation for his empathy towards average humans as well as his craftsmanship abilities, youth of Vulcan, when the Primarchs were scattered from the Emperor's laboratory, Vulcan arrived on the planet Nocturne during the time of trial as an infant and was soon taken in by the blacksmith, Nbel. Nbel raised Vulcan, naming him after the first king of the Salamanders, and the young Primarch considered him his father. The people of his hometown were astounded by this child. For within the space of three years, he was stronger and bigger than any man in his town. In addition to his massive physical size, he was the quickest mind, and the greatest blacksmith anyone knew of. Indeed, it was not long before Vulcan himself was teaching forging techniques to the people that had not yet been discovered. The people of Nocturne were frequently raided by Dark Eldar. They were so used to this common occurrence, that each person in town had developed their own hiding place to avoid capture. When the Dark Eldar raided again in Vulcan's fourth year on Nocturne, the Primarch refused to hide and instead stood out in the center of the settlement, his two smithing hammers crossed over his shoulders. The people of Vulcan's town were so inspired by his example that they joined him and prepared to defend their town. With a Primarch leading the defense, the people of the town decisively defeated the Dark Eldar. Vulcan alone killed a hundred Eldar that day. Within weeks the leaders of the seven largest towns on Nocturne had traveled to meet Vulcan, and they soon swore never again to hide from the raiders, in celebration of the Primarch's victory over the Eldar raiders, a tournament was decided to be held. Unexpectedly, a stranger arrived in the middle of the festivities. Of pale complexion and wearing outlandish clothing, the stranger asked only to be allowed to compete. When he announced that he could best anyone in the town, the people laughed at this outlander. Who could possibly beat Vulcan in any feat of intellect, strength, craftsmanship, or endurance? Nonetheless, Vulcan and the stranger wagered that whoever lost the tournament would forever serve the victor. Lasting eight days, the contest included many tests of strength and endurance such as the anvil lift in which the two held anvils above their heads for a half day before the contest was called a tie. The number of contests is unimportant, however, for by the end of day eight, Vulcan and the stranger were tied. In the final event, both contestants were given 24 hours to construct a weapon, before using said weapon to hunt down and slay the largest salamander they could find. Climbing a high mountain, the two each went out to find a drake. Vulcan quickly found and killed a very large fire drake. However, on his way back, the mountain he was standing on, which coincidentally was a volcano, erupted, casting Vulcan over a cliff. Hanging for dear life over the precipice, Vulcan was determined to hang on to his massive salamander. Thus, he found himself hanging by one hand from a cliff with his other hand clutching the tail of his drake, hanging there for hours, Vulcan's strength eventually ebbed away until he knew he must decide between the drake and his life. At that moment, however, the stranger arrived, carrying his own drake. Even from the edge of the cliff, the Primarch could tell that the outlander's drake was indeed bigger. Seeing Vulcan in distress, the stranger acted quickly, tossing his drake into a lava flow that separated them and using it as a bridge to cross to the Primarch. After hoisting Vulcan out of his mortal predicament, the stranger walked with him back to town, leaving his own drake to burn in the river of molten rock. Though the outlander's drake had been superior in size, he had thrown it away to save Vulcan, and when he returned to town with the Primarch empty-handed, Vulcan was declared the victor. To the amazement of his people, however, 
Vulcan kneeled before the stranger and said that any man who would value life over pride was worthy of his service. At this moment, the outlander cast off his illusionary disguise and revealed himself to be the holy emperor of humanity. Thus it was that the pre-march, Vulcan and his emperor were reunited. Vulcan in Great Crusade, it is believed that at first Vulcan did not become unified with his own legion for some years after his rediscovery, instead staying alongside the emperor under his tutelage and fighting by his side. When Vulcan was eventually reunited with his legion, it was at the head of a fleet of 3,000 new recruits which saved his forces from a massive orc horde. Eventually it was decided that Vulcan's legion of space marines would henceforth be known as the Salamanders. In honor of the beast that had united him with his father, the pre-march continued to serve loyally throughout the Great Crusade. At some point during the Great Crusade, Vulcan and his legion participated in reconquest of a world designated 1546, locally known as Caratan, together with the Night Lords led by their pre-march, Conrad Kurz, and Mechanicum Titan Legion Legio Ignis and several Imperial Army regiments. During this campaign, Vulcan became enraged by how Kurz and his legion waged war after he found out that the Night Lords had killed the inhabitants of a whole city in order to seed fear amongst the population. This confrontation between Vulcan and Kurz resulted in a brief but fierce argument between the two Primarchs. After conclusion of this campaign, Vulcan reported Kurz's behavior and actions to War Master Horus and Primarch Dorn of the Imperial Fists. However, during the battle against Caratan's ruling Eldar Coven, Vulcan flew into a rage when the Remembrancer Seraph was killed, and killed a surrendering Eldar child. This incident would haunt the Primarch deeply. On the world of 1544 Vulcan and his army came into contact with tribes of primitive humans living alongside Exodite Eldar. Surprisingly, the humans did not welcome the Imperial invaders. Vulcan was guided by a mysterious remembrancer, later discovered to be a psychic projection of the Emperor, to a webway portal. After a vicious battle the portal, Vulcan came across human tribals preparing to sacrifice a Dark Eldar woman. The humans had learned to fear the Dark Eldar raiders, and sought to sacrifice her to ward off their return now that the Exodites had been defeated. Moreover, Vulcan realized that the Dark Eldar woman was from the raiding parties that terrorized Nocturne in his youth, and these humans were descendants of Nocturne captives liberated by the Eldar. Vulcan realized the Emperor had guided him here and understand that these humans would never accept the Imperium over their Eldar liberators, ordered the planet cleansed. He sought to erase any trace of human Zeno's coexistence. Later when Vulcan gave his protest to Horus, he sensed a great darkness within him. This caused Vulcan to neglect giving Horus the Hammer Dawnbringer. Vulcan in Horus Heresy, Vulcan was present alongside Ferris Manus and Corax at the Istvan v. Dropsite Massacre. During the battle the majority of the Salamander's legion was killed by nuclear missiles fired from the Iron Warriors. Due to his perpetual regeneration abilities, Vulcan survived the explosion but found himself surrounded by hundreds of warriors from the Iron Warriors and Night Lords. Fighting to what he thought was his death, Vulcan was stabbed, shot and bludgeoned in unconsciousness. Seeing a chance to torment his brother, Conrad Kurz took Vulcan prisoner. The pre-march of the Night Lords spent the next several months trying to both break Vulcan's spirit and trying to kill him. Kurz personally cut Vulcan's head off, ripped out his throat with a fork, stabbed him through the chest and tore him limb from limb. Separately, he had Vulcan eviscerated, shot with hundreds of bolters at close range, left in the venting shaft of a starship's engine and even thrown in empty space completely naked. Each time Vulcan died his body would regenerate completely, leaving Curse furious. Eventually, frustrated and bored with his inability to kill Vulcan, Kurz decided to get Vulcan to admit he was no less a monster than himself. Kurz had several Davenite priests ensnare Vulcan's mind and run him through trial after trial, ensuring he failed each time and innocence died. When Vulcan would not break, Kurz decided to end things in a duel. 
he made Vulcan navigate a maze designed by Percherabo, at the center of which lay Dombringer, Vulcan's personal hammer, as well as the corpses of several of his comrades. When Vulcan retrieved his hammer he managed to overpower Kurz and activated a teleporter built into the head of the hammer. Vulcan was transported across the galaxy into the upper atmosphere of Macridge and burned up during re-entry, confident he would wake up in the care of the Ultramarines. His charred body was later recovered by the Ultramarines, who at first were unable to identify the corpse as anything more than a grotesque statue, all living matter having burned up on re-entry. Over a series of days Vulcan's body began to regenerate, eventually returning to life and shocking the ultramarine's apothecaries he had been entrusted to. Realizing who it was, the apothecaries summoned their primarch, Robert Gilliman, who was at first furious that no one could give him any answers as to how or why Vulcan had suddenly fallen from the skies. To Gilliman's horror he found that Vulcan was broken mentally, violent and incoherent, attacking anything and everything he could, unknown to everyone, a bond of sorts had formed between Kurz and Vulcan, the latter being able to sense when the night haunter was nearby. Kurz was indeed on Macridge, having been trapped aboard the Invincible Reason, but eventually breaking out of the Dark Angel's flagship and stealing a drop pod to the surface. Vulcan broke free of his bonds and pillaged Gilliman's private armory before setting off to hunt Kurz. The two fought across an entire city, Vulcan finally realizing his regenerative abilities and using them to his advantage, by focusing his will, he could regenerate much quicker. At one point Kurz shot Vulcan's head off, causing the Primarch to fall from a cliff. Vulcan was back alive before he hit the ground. Their rolling duel was eventually stopped by the Perpetual, John Grammaticus, who had been charged by the Cabal to permanently kill Vulcan with the Fulgurite a petrified bolt of the Emperor's own psychic abilities. The Cabal had ordered Grammaticus to give the Fulgurite to Cruz, as only a Primarch could kill another Primarch. But before he could complete his mission, Eldred Ulthran appeared to Grammaticus, convincing him that if he himself used the Fulgurite to kill Vulcan, he would give up his perpetual nature forever. But in exchange completely restore Vulcan's mind. The presences and abilities of another Primarch in the Emperor's armies would tip the balance against Horus. Grammaticus stabbed Vulcan through the heart, killing both of them in a psychic explosion. Grammaticus regenerated, as he always did, but was aware this would be his last life. Vulcan never recovered. Later, Vulcan's corpse was reclaimed by the Primarchs Gilliman, Lionel Johnson, and Sanguinius. Vulcan was placed in a stasis capsule, handcrafted by Gilliman himself, with the words Unbound Flame carved into the side. The few remaining salamanders who had made it to Macridge were allowed to stand guard over their fallen Primarch until such time as he could be returned to Nocturne. During their vigil, the salamanders thought they heard a heartbeat coming from the casket, but dismissed it. Convinced he could be resurrected, an expedition back to Nocturne led by Artelis Numian eventually was able to bring Vulcan's body back to Nocturne and with Numian as the final sacrifice. Vulcan was restored from the unbound flame at Mount Deathfire. Upon his resurrection, Vulcan was in a condition similar to a fugue state and remembered little. He found himself in the depths of M.T. Deathfire, conversing with an old man calling himself Deathfire personified. The man urged Vulcan to travel to Terra and led the Primarch to two items that he had no memory of forging, the Thunder Hammer Erdricule and the Talisman of Seven Hammers. When Vulcan awoke, he was at the steps of M.T. Deathfire and discovered by three of his legionaries, Atakabidemi, Barak Zydos, and Ijen Gargo. Vulcan ordered the three to return in three days and forbade them to speak to any else that the Primarch had returned to Nocturne. When the three returned, now dubbed Vulcan's Draxword, the Primarch used his talisman to open a webway portal deep below Nocturne. What followed next was an arduous journey through multiple webway tunnels and exists to reach Terra. Vulcan and his Draxword found themselves in a satellite realm of Comorak, battling Dark Eldar.
They next found themselves with the fleet of Shadrach Medusin, still engaged in a guerrilla war against Horus. Vulcan found Medusin's fleet in the midst of upheaval, with the cult of the Gorgon claiming that it had resurrected Ferris Manus. Upon meeting the supposed reborn Ferris, Vulcan discovered it to be little more than a mechanical puppet with one of Ferris' metallic arms attached. Saddened that his brother would be shamed so, Vulcan shattered the puppet with his hammer. Vulcan refused to take part in Medusin's war and during the Battle of the Aragna Chain. Left for Caldera. On Caldera, Vulcan was greeted by Eldar, who guided him to a new webway portal on the orders of Eldred Ulthran. Inside the webway once more, Vulcan and the Draxward ventured upon Kalistar, long since abandoned since the war within the webway. In Kalistar the companions were beset by demons and Vulcan became engaged in a battle with the great unclean one Agalber. Using the talisman of seven hammers, Vulcan was able to not only slay the daemon but give it a true death. Still beset by demonic hordes, the companions were saved by Eldred, revealing himself as the old man of M.T. Deathfire, revealing that the way into the imperial dungeon had been sealed by the emperor. Eldred opened up a new portal that took Vulcan and his warriors to the front of the imperial palace. Vulcan was reunited with a visibly relieved Rogel Dorn, but promptly led by custodes to the Golden Throne to meet with the Emperor himself. The Emperor, now trapped on the throne, revealed that he had not only been expecting Vulcan but had been guiding him this entire journey and had been the force that compelled him to construct Erdricule and the Talisman of Seven Hammers. The Emperor told Vulcan that the Primarch's purpose had always been intended for this moment. For he was designed to construct the talisman and oversee its true purpose. The Emperor revealed that the talisman was weapon of unprecedented power, a dead man's switch that would consume all of Terra should Horus succeed in the coming struggle. It would be Vulcan's duty to press the switch that would destroy Terra but deny the world to the powers of chaos. Vulcan was horrified by the prospect, but the Emperor told him that he must be the one to oversee the device for the pre-march has always been the most hesitant to use the weapons he forges. With that, Vulcan installed the talisman into the Golden Throne and took up position by the Eternity Gate. Keeping his existence a secret save for a select few during the Siege of Terra, Vulcan next saw action when Magnus the Red and a group of his thousand sons infiltrated the Imperial Dungeon to kill the Emperor. Vulcan blocked a lethal blow by Magnus' staff that had been intended for the Emperor's form upon the Golden Throne, but quickly backed down and alongside their father bid Magnus to return to the Imperial's fold. Vulcan became disheartened when Magnus refused the offer to return to the Loyalists after the Emperor told him that he would have to purge his legion due to its rampant mutations. Vulcan himself admitted he would have made the same choice as Magnus, but nonetheless again defended the Emperor against the Crimson King's assault. Vulcan and Magnus then engaged in a furious duel, but was saved from a decapitating blow thanks to the sacrifice of Igen Gargo. Horrified by his son's death and taking up his thunder hammer, Vulcan wielded twin hammers to seemingly beat Magnus to submission. However before a visibly despairing Vulcan could deliver the final blow Magnus fully gave himself to the powers of chaos and vanished from the throne room. With Magnus now inside the imperial webway and enacting a psychic ritual to sap the emperor's remaining strength, Vulcan was dispatched by Malkador to put an end to his brother as the Eternity Gate itself was besieged. As he moved through the webway he ignored Magnus' lies and goadings along the way. After journeying to the impossible city to the webway, Vulcan finally came before Magnus. Again ignoring his brother's manipulations including a vision of the burning of Prospero, the two came to blows. Initially in their battle, Vulcan seemed to hit nothing but smoke and it became apparent he was swinging his hammer at smoke. The real Magnus was behind a psychic barrier, steeped with his own ritual, to weaken the Emperor. Vulcan took advantage of this by smashing through the already stressed Magnus barrier, forcing the Crimson King to try and kill Vulcan directly so that he may be allowed to complete his work. 
Magnus tried every method conceivable to kill his brother. He beheaded him with his kopesh. Suffocated him by turning his lungs to amber, drained him of his blood, and immolated him with psychic fire. However nothing worked, and each time the perpetual Vulcan would regenerate and continue to hammer away at Magnus, attrition took hold, and Magnus grew increasingly desperate. He entered Vulcan's mind as the noble he had once been, attempting to explain his actions. Vulcan had none of it however, scolding Magnus for his arrogant and reckless use of sorcery that had turned him into a slave to chaos. In the webway, Vulcan stood above Magnus ready to deliver the killing blow. However he hesitated despite the emperor's own voice ordering the salamander's pre-march to kill his brother. Magnus used this moment to unleash the spell he had been working on, undoing Vulcan at a genetic level in a desperate bid to finally kill him. As Vulcan crumbled apart he nonetheless was able to swing his hammer, smashing off Magnus' head with Urdercule and banishing him into the warp. Later, Vulcan's regenerating form was seen slowly making it back to the palace's webway portal. Urdercule in hand. Post-heresy, it is claimed Vulcan was one of the primarchs to oppose the Codex Astartes. This however, would not be for lack of courage or loyalty, however, but due to the crippling losses sustained at Istvan V, where his legion was cut down in size to but a few. During the great scouring he became furious at the tales of the horrors visited upon Terra's population by the emperor's children and attempted to find and kill Fabius Bile. Sometime later, Vulcan chose to leave the salamanders. Claiming that, like Space Wolves pre-March Lehman Russ, he would return in the end times. That is the last anyone saw of Vulcan for the next 1,500 years. 1,500 years later, during the War of the Beast, Vulcan reappeared, single-handedly defending the Imperial world of Caldera from a massive orc invasion. Though he died many times against the green skins, he would regenerate and appear again at the forefront. Vulcan's one-man war on Caldera was unveiled by the Inquisition, and Lord Commander of the Imperium Corland led an expedition to the world to recruit him for a counteroffensive against the mighty warboss known as the Beast. Vulcan was eventually discovered by the expedition but refused to lead it until Caldera was saved citing a vow long ago he made to the world to never again let it fall to flame. With the aid of the Imperial forces, Vulcan was able to save Caldera from destruction by destroying the attack moon construction generator. After saving Caldera, Vulcan returned to Terra with Corland. He took command of the frantic Imperium, scolding the High Lords for their squabblings and inefficiency but stating he would not purge them for the sake of unity. He then proclaimed that he would lead the might of the Imperium to Ulanor, the homeworld of the beast. Vulcan made clear that his return was temporary, for he was destined to reappear for another war in another time. Vulcan officially led the subsequent crusade to Ulanor to find and slay the beast once and for all. But in truth left most of the details to Corland who he gave his full support to. Instead, Vulcan tinkered with Doomtremor and remained isolated in his chambers aboard the Fist's Exemplar's battle barge Alcazar remembered. Though this discouraged many at first, Vulcan leapt into the fray of battle directly when the Imperial forces reached the capital city of Ulanor, Gorkagrad. Vulcan eventually led the final charge into the beast's massive temple gargant and confronted the warboss directly. Realizing that Vulcan had always intended to fight the beast alone and knowing he could do little in the fight, Corland ordered an evacuation from the temple as the two giants clashed. The ten-meter-high war boss revealed he spoke perfect imperial gothic, gloating that humanity was on its knees and he would be its end. Vulcan tackled the war boss and they both fell into the temple gargant's power generator where the pre-march became imbued with massive amounts of WAC energies, rather than be consumed by the energies as so many other men had. Vulcan used his primal and savage essence to become one with it and launch one last attack. He slammed Doomtremor into the beast's face and detonated the generator, 
causing a chain reaction that shattered the temple gargant and seemingly obliterating them both. Vulcan was presumed dead by the Imperium and Corland stated that his sacrifice would be forever remembered. However, the salamanders still hunt him in the 41st millennium. They believe that he will return to them after they have found all nine of the artifacts of Vulcan, like his brother Primarchs, Vulcan has a characteristic that sets him apart, his patience and humanity. Though possibly Jean bred into his temperament, this was also likely influenced by his upbringing in a small village. He demonstrates this characteristic many times on 1544. Vulcan constantly gives commands in the heat of battle that cause the least amount of casualties to the native population against the advice of Ferris Manus and even his own men. It is spoken of among his brothers that Vulcan is the most suited to their father's vision of a peaceful imperium. Vulcan is the largest and physically strongest of all the Primarchs. He is said to be as tall in his power armor as Horus is in his own, much larger Terminator armor, and is capable of overturning space marine battle tanks with his bare hands. During sparring matches with his brother Primarchs, Vulcan deliberately held back out of fear of hurting them. Vulcan was equipped with many finely crafted weapons built by his own hands. Most notable of these was the massive Thunder Hammer Dawnbringer and the plasma pistol the Furnace's Heart. Before forging Dawnbringer, originally intended as a gift for Horus, Vulcan used the Hammer Thunderhead. For protection he wore the Baroque power armor known as the Draken Scale, which included the Gauntlet of the Forge and Khazar's Mantle. 14. After his resurrection following the Battle of Nocturne, Vulcan wielded the Hammer Erdrichiel. 1,500 years later, during the War of the Beast, Vulcan wielded the Hammer Doom Tremor. He forged thousands of unique and dangerous artifacts in his lifetime, but charged the first Forge Father, Tkel, with destroying them as he departed for Istvan V. He conceded to allow Tkel to spare seven, which were to be locked away in the rot if Vulcan fell at Istvan. These seven, along with the gauntlet of the forge and Khazar's mantle worn by Vulcan at Istvan, survived to become known as the Nine Artifacts of Vulcan, and are still sought out today. During his lifetime, Vulcan left prodigious philosophical writings, particularly those recorded in the Tome of Fire, a vast series of writings that, amongst other more mundane teachings, are said to hold glimpses of the future and prophecies yet to be fulfilled. Yet even the more mundane of his writings held profound lessons, many of which have gone on to become key tenets of the Promethean Creed, ours is a violent calling, but as adherents of the Promethean Creed we believe in the circle of fire. None can come back as they once were, but in death we are returned to the ash from whence we came to be born anew, our blood and bone bonded with the earth. Through fire are our remains made protean, through fire and the reunion with earth do we experience rebirth. After death, after our duty is ended, we give ourselves to these elements and in so doing become a part of them. This is the nature of the circle of fire. Words of Vulcan